Most interesting things that you will find, I guarantee you, this is probably one of the most important seminars you will be in right now. Everybody needs to pitch products and figure out how to get to the right people and how to move yourself through the process. And I got to say, Stephen, I actually watched one of his videos as recently and I just realized that I have been doing it wrong for all these years. And there's a, an incredible process that he's put together to really how to maximize getting to the right people. Because it's really about finding the right people, influencing the influencers, and getting things done. Because if you pitch wrong, you got, you know, you got basically you know, two minutes to get your point across. And if you miss it, chances are you're not going to get where you need to go. And this guy is going to show you something I guarantee you will be one of the most valuable lessons. And I have, I got to say, it's changed my life in that sense because now I'll do it the right way. Anyway, Stephen Mead, ladies and gentlemen. All right, well, the good news is I get everybody just back from lunch. So I will uh, do my best to keep you guys awake as I go through this. And to begin, um, I'm going to start out, what I'm going to go through is, is really some step-by-step -step tactical techniques. I don't know if you guys are like me. I go to a lot of events and seminars, and, and I'm not a real rah-rah guy. I, I like leaving with something tangible that I can actually put in place and use. And that's what I'm going to do, but I, I want to start out. Some of this is going to be interactive. Since it's a small group, it's going to be easier. When I say isolation, tell me what comes to mind when you think of the word isolation. Being by yourself. Being by yourself. All right. It's, it's like being alone, right? And this picture doesn't help. The picture sets the stage for the state of being alone, being isolated, being separate. The words that we think and the stories we tell ourselves reflect so much on how we act. And we can instantly change just... He just wants to move that mic up. Sorry, oh, <laughs> Sorry but we want to hear you. Cool. That's all right, because I'm taller. There we go. There we go. All right, just perfect. That mic. Thanks, buddy. Can I just do it this way, Scott, and walk? Yeah, yeah, Is yeah. Is that better? Okay, okay. Yeah. Thanks, because I'll, I'll kind of move around a little bit. Rockstar Scott. All right, so watch how easy this is, guys. Just the term isolation, I'm going to change the frame of reference for isolation in one second. Ah, isolation is a good thing. See, just the term isolation, whatever we tell ourselves in our mind, that's how we act and react. So if you reframe how you think about things, you can actually reframe a lot of your definitions. So the new definition for isolation is a good thing. Complete and utter focus, specific and clearly defined or without leaving doubt of intent. That's why when I say isolation is a good thing, people go, what do you mean? I know exactly who I want to mean, what I want, how I'm trying to accomplish it. And that's what we're going to go through. We're going to fly through a lot of information. A couple things right away. Realize all you can control around you are your actions and your attitude. You can't control the people, you can't control who says yes, who says no, who's late, who's not in the room after lunch. You know, I know Scott's been running around, and I'm like, Scott, focus on the people that are here. That's all you can control. All right, so your actions and your attitude are really, everything outside of that is beyond your control. So learn how to focus on that. This is what you guys are doing. It doesn't matter how many resources you have, if you don't know how to use them, if you can't tell this is a guy standing on a little ladder, but it's a stack of ladders and he's trying to peer over. You guys are taking the time to learn how to get better, and that's a, that's a resource that's really valuable. Can you stay focused? I want to see if this works on a big screen. I'm going to put this little thing up. It's not a trick. It's a graph. Can you guys see it spinning? Does it look like it's spinning? It's supposed to? It's kind of interesting. I want every one of you to pick a dot, a single dot, and stare at that dot and tell me what happens. If it works... If you stare at the dot, what happens to the spinning? Stay still. It stops. The point is, I didn't tell you which dot to focus on. So much of your life are all these things spinning around you, and you've got to pick something to stay focused on, and then the world stops spinning. You know, so it's, it's about learning how to not be distracted by a lot of things. doesn't matter where you're going. Any road will get you there. A lot of people tell you that. It's like, where do I want to go? Well, I don't care. Then just take off. It doesn't matter. Know your vision. This one... Don't take this one personally. Some people don't like it. They're a little offended on the West Coast. think it's not politically direct. I kind of like it. doesn't matter if you don't know where you're going. Know your vision. Because if you don't know where you're going, your followers might not make it. I don't know if you guys can see. Little ducks didn't quite make it across the grade. It's supposed to be funny. I guess it's not working out here. Sorry. All right. So let's do this. We're going to jump into a couple quick things. Um, number one, I... I 
I do a lot. I don't do speaking as a, as a profession anymore. I did it years ago. Now we actually build technology companies. But I like doing this stuff for fun. And every time we start a new company, there's a lot of people who like it and a lot of people that don't. Right? Would you guys agree? A lot of stuff you're doing, some people... All right, so I want to show you something for perspective. It's about what your values are. And you guys can help me out with this. It's kind of fill in the blank. Birds of a feather flock together, together but opposites attract. Like, all right, wait a minute. Let's try another one. Your word is your bond, but don't believe everything you hmm. You have to see it to believe it, but looks can be fish or cut. Hey. Thank you. Somebody's from the South. Fish or cut bait or fake it till you make it. Right. make it. So the point here is every one of these values on one side has somebody else that says the exact opposite. And my favorite, a quote, everybody is a genius. So remember, everybody's a genius. But if you spin, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it spends its whole life believing it's stupid. Anybody know who said that? Everybody's a genius, but if a fish is trying to climb a tree, it's stupid. Albert Einstein. Like, all right, that's interesting. Here's the next quote. Two things in the universe are infinite. Or two things are infinite. The universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe. Mark Twain. Good guess, but no, again, Einstein. Einstein. So Einstein thinks everybody's a genius, but the only thing he's definitive about is everybody's stupid. <laughs> all right? So, so no matter what you do, you've got to learn how to set your values and, and just believe in them. And as we roll through, what's your vision? How do you set your goals? What do you define yourself as wanting to be? You know, what's your vision? What's your goal? What do you want to accomplish? And it's, a, it's an aspect of learning how to be really specific in what those are. And, and we're going to go through some steps on that. But learn how to create a vision and learn how to articulate it. So step one, we're going to fly through the steps pretty easily. Step one is begin with the end in mind. Some people have heard of it. It's a Stephen Covey principle. But primarily it says, hey, if I looked out ten years from now in my life... What do I want my life to be like? Right? Picture yourself standing on a stage or on top of a mountain looking around going, this is what I want my life to be like. And, and what you start saying is, if, I, if I'm in music, do I want to be an entertainer or a musician? Do I want to be a big star? Do I want to be a, a star where I can spend a lot of time with my family? Do I want to travel or not travel? Do I want to travel first class or do I want to, you know, it's like how can you be specific at the end of the day to say, 10 years from now, this is what I want my life to be like. And get really, really specific. And by specific, I mean, I'll give you an example. A friend of mine, I was doing this with him a while ago, and I feel like I'm, this is like a comedian stage with the, the light and the microphone. It just feels kind of weird. Um, sorry. I'll try to make you guys laugh. I'm not good at it. A friend of mine, though, I was going through this process with her, and we went through, and she's like, I want to win an Oscar, I want to be the best mom possible, and I'm like, it's not specific. She goes, no, I really, and I said, all right, I'll give you an example, you're probably going to win an Oscar in three years. I guarantee. She's like, well, no. Now, the point is, she had actually started a film production company, left, and she was now trying to become an actress or an actor. And what I told her, I said, here's why I mean by being specific. My guess is the company you founded is going to win an Oscar for best sound design, best get on an animation in New Zealand. I don't know, some dumb Oscar that's presented on Saturday, not Sunday, and you're going to be on stage with 30 other people standing there with your Oscar saying, this sucks. She didn't just want to win an Oscar. She wanted to win it for best actress in a supporting role or in a defense. It's like learning how to be specific is really a trick. And that's what this is. It's just learn how to begin with the end in mind and be as specific as you can, and, and those things start attracting themselves to you. See yourself at the top of a mountain and stay there. How many of you have been hiking? All right. Hiking is not a straight shot up the mountain. Would you guys agree? Mm -hmm. Twist, turns, up, down. But if you've been to the top and you stood there, you're kind of like, wow, this is really cool, and you're willing to suffer to get to the top. Business is like that. Business is not a straight shot. It's a messy, twisty curve. <clears throat> But the reason you keep hiking is you know at the top you get to stand there and look around and go, this is the view that's worth it. Yeah. That's what your life is. The, the setbacks you have along the way aren't the setbacks. It's just a step in the journey if you know where you want to be at the end. So this is all just kind of little visual stuff. Uh, number two, any of you guys that were in, in one of the panels earlier, Rich said something interesting. And, and this is the premise that says, whiff who whiff them. LA is a lot about whiff them. Anybody know what whiff them is? What's in it for me? 
right? We're all, we're all in it for ourselves. Like, hey, what's in it for me? The process is, how can I figure out what's in it for you? How can you figure out how to add value to the other person? How can you figure out what the other person wants or needs? How can you figure out what's important to that other person? You know, what are their goals? What are they trying to accomplish? What are they motivated by in business? Especially when you're talking about, we deal a lot with large companies, and I want to sell our technology to companies all day long. They could care less about me. But if I know what's important to the company, then it becomes what's important to them. So with who with them is having a mindset that says, what's in it for the other person, and then let me figure out what's in it for me. And here's a little technique on how to do it. Two quick little things. How can you add value with the following? Now, this is what most people might do. Let's say you're sending a simple email, and you've got an email that you got introduced to the head of a record label, or an A&R guy, or a brand, or somebody Coca-Cola. And most people might send an email generically like this. Hello, Mr. Smith. We have an amazing widget that does circus tricks. You know, we've got great success. We've been written about. We've won awards. Now, you can put your own words in there. We've got a great band. We've done this. We had 5,000 people show up. That's how most people would start out, trying to establish, hey, look at me and what I've done credibly. The way we do most of our emails is we invert it, and we always try to start an email with the word you. It's difficult to do, but whenever I meet with somebody, I don't say thank you for meeting or that. I'm like, you took the time to meet with me. We greatly appreciate it. You know, your efforts in meeting with my team were really important. If you start a sentence with you or your, it's a weird little trick where psychologically people pay more attention. So the example here we said is, you were recently featured in an article I read. It said you were looking for your next opportunity. You wanted to leave a legacy for your family. I think we have something that might help you to accomplish your goal. This was a guy leaving ABC, president. I got a meeting with him in an email exactly like that. It was about four sentences. Didn't know what we did. Didn't matter. I read that he was leaving. He wanted to leave a legacy for his daughters. And I'm like, hey, might have something to help you leave a legacy. It was all about doing business with us, but the email and the attraction and the approach was all about what's important to him. Same thing in a phone call. Hey, let me tell you what we do. Look how great we are. This is amazing. Look at our number of YouTube stats. Look at our number of viewers, on and on. That's how people approach it. As opposed to inverting it and saying, we have something that might help you hit your target. The YouTube guys, Robert Kinsel and all these guys, are driven by metrics. A lot of the, the management groups are driven by profit or goals or targets. The more you know about what's important to that person, you can reframe how you have a conversation with them about how you can help them accomplish their goal. At the end of the day is you want them doing business with you, but it's about how you're helping them. So it's just a, a little different reframe, and the whole goal is to try and redo the conversation of, of important to the other person. So this one's kind of fun and interesting. It's, it's what do you do? Have you guys ever been out a little networking event? Hey, what do you do? And if you ask somebody, they kind of ramble on and tell you what they do. Most of the time when I talk to people, this is how I feel. I feel like I'm a little baby that's confused. I'm like, I don't get what you do. You guys live in a world where your terminology is completely different than somebody that's not in your world. Right? We live in a software world. One of our companies, we're an ASP and an SAS and a proprietary platform redeploying assets across an enterprise as an ERP initiative. No clue. Right? But then we're in another world, and we have a company called Cineplex, and we're an HLR into an SS7 insertion into the switch mechanism on the call setup to insert an audio message in the sequencing gap of a handset to deploy a message to nobody that's ever heard it before. The operators we talk to are like, oh, that's amazing. Everybody else is like, what are you talking about? So it happens when we're talking to people, this is what we think we are. We think we're rock stars. Right? And I used to do the, the little example, and I, I won't do it now, but I'll, I'll do it myself as, the, as my own test. I'm going to type a song, and I want you guys to tell me what song this is. Ready? All right, what song is that? Happy birthday. I always get happy birthday. I'm going to suck on this, but no, it's not happy birthday. Happy birthday. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say. Here's the point. In my head, I heard that song perfectly. I knocked it out of the park, man. I'm, I'm a rock star. When you guys are talking, that's exactly what happens. You're like, I'm knocking it out of the park. They, and people are like, what are you talking about? What do you do? 
We're going to fix that right now. This is how most people feel after they talk to you. We're going to turn it around. I'm going to teach you something called the tornado technique. This is kind of the middle crux of the whole presentation of, of really how to position yourself differently when you're talking to somebody. And it doesn't matter who you're talking to. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you're trying to accomplish. This technique can isolate what you do and what you want and what you need in under 30 seconds in any business. And it doesn't matter if you need venture capital. It doesn't mean if you need sponsors. It doesn't matter if you need managers. This can be used for anything, but there's a sequence to it. It's psychological. It builds on it. How many people have actually seen a tornado in person? One. Got to be from the Oh, here's a couple. Okay. Here's my only trick question. I don't usually ask trick questions. This is a two-part trick question. What's the most powerful part of a tornado? I told you guys it's a trick question, so nobody wants to answer. That's not fair. A lot of people say the center. Well, there is no center in a tornado. That's a hurricane, and the center of a hurricane is actually the calmest part, so they're wrong twice. Yeah. A tornado, if it spins around up in the air where the little cow and dog and refrigerator are flying around, it doesn't matter. If it touches the ground, the little tip of the tornado touches the ground, that's what causes all the destruction. So what we're going to do is figure out how to psychologically have conversations with people where you become a powerful tornado. And this is how it works. Number one, Realize most people don't care what you do, or they don't understand it. Right? When we're talking to people, we're trying to be nice. We kind of care. Sometimes we don't. But if we do care, we don't always understand what people do. And what you do is irrelevant to what you need. So here's what I mean. Here's the technique. It's four or five steps. Pretty simple. Number one, what is the emotional value of what you do? What are the benefits of how you help people? What... What is something different or unique about what you do or what you offer that has nothing to do with the technical, nothing to do with anything? It's, there's something cool and unique and emotional and visceral about what you do. That's what you need to find out. You need to figure out what that is. So when you tell people, oh, we do X, and they're like, oh, that's cool, even though they don't understand it. Number two under there is what is the industry, the genre? What is the type of customer? If you have a company and you have existing customers, you're like, oh, well, we're in these three or four industries. If you have a new company, oh, we're trying to go in these four industries. If you're a musician, oh, I'm trying to go into these kinds of genres. As you start going down, the mind starts sequencing down and going, oh, that's cool. Oh, you're in these industries. Within those industries, there are certain companies either that you're dealing with or that you want to meet. If you're trying to get sponsorship, Hey, I want sponsorship in these areas. Here's the four or five companies I'd love to partner with. So it's your responsibility to come up with the names of who your best customers are. It's not mine. I have people all the time tell me what they do, and they're like, oh, can you help me? I'm like, I don't, I don't know what you need. Like, oh, I, I just told you what I did. I'm like, fine, but like, who are your top three customers? Who are, give me the company. Who are you trying to get to? Let's start isolating names and faces so those start popping up in your head. And then the research within there is within the companies, there are certain titles. Who are the titles of people you want to meet? You know, again, we, we deal with huge companies. We're dealing with Disney on something. They have 85,000 employees. No, I don't need Disney. I need David Mann, who runs new technology for all of the venture of Disney. Oh, I want to be represented at CAA. Okay, they have 3,000 agents. Who? Oh, I want David Tinzer, who's there for 25 years and does television because David would get what I do. It's your responsibility to do research and go, who would actually best represent or understand what I'm doing? So those are the titles. Then within the titles, you research to find the name of exactly who you want to meet. And this is where you're specific and shy. Don't be shy. How many of you guys have a wish list right now, the top three or five people you'd love to meet in your industry? Know them by name. A couple people raise their hand, a couple don't. You need to. Like somebody stood in front of you right now and said, who are the three people you want to make to make your dreams come true? You don't know those three people. It's hard for somebody to help you. Right? So figure it out and don't be shy. We've got big, amazing people involved in our companies because we've learned how to ask in this kind of specific way. So I'm going to give you two examples. I'm going to use one that's one of our own companies, show you how it works, and then I made another one up. So here, here we go. This is how simple this is. We have a company we're launching probably on Monday called MAGMO, stands for Magazine Moments. What do you do? It's really simple. 
We have a photo sharing social network where people can create mini magazines in under 60 seconds. And we're going to go after Facebook and Instagram. Now, what do we do? How do we? It doesn't matter. It's photo sharing, social network, 60 seconds going after Facebook. That's all I want somebody to remember. But we're targeted after celebrities, management, big brands. We're going after fashion and automotive, these kind of big industries that spend a lot of money promoting things. We're dealing with companies like Conde Nast, NFL, The Collective. So now we're down to specific companies. Within those companies, we deal with the chief marketing officer. So if you know any CMOs of really big brands, I'd love to talk to them. And by the way, we want to meet Martin Sorrell, Jeff Skull, Chris Saka, Ashton Kutcher, Timberlake, guys like that. If you happen to know any of those guys, that's what I do. What we do is we don't do software. We, don't, we talk to these people because that's who we're trying to get to. Right, now, this is an interesting point. How many people know who Martin Sorrell is? Jeff Skull? Chris Saka? Ashton Kutcher? Mm -hmm. Justin Timberlake? Yep. Here's what's important about this. Martin Sorrell. Martin is president of WPP. Up until a week ago, the largest advertising agency in the world. Google Sys just merged with somebody. Martin is now number two. Martin doesn't like being number two. I think I have something that might help him get back to number one. He wants to be the top ad agency in the world. It's a multi-billion dollar company. You don't know Martin Sorrell. That's okay. Somebody else will. Jeff Skull, Participant Productions, Syriana, Kai Runner, Charlie Wilson's War, Contagion, came out of eBay, works out all the time up on Sunset. See, these are the guys that I want to go after. Chris Saka, Google, he's invested in Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram. Chris is kind of a rock star in the industry. Ashton's doing a bunch of investing in technology. Justin's got his new tech fund. So my point is, not everybody's going to know the people that you need to meet but some people will. Your list needs to be who the best people are in the industry that you want to meet. So I'll, I'll give you another one. Does that make sense on this? Yeah. And, and I can do it on anything. How many of you guys were here on the opening when we did the opening on, on whatever day it was? I don't know what to do. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to do this real quick to show you how powerful this is on something that's completely off the radar. I use a company we have all the time called Ronastar, Return on Net Assets. That was the one I was making fun of earlier. And it's an SAP and an SA. It's a bunch of stuff people wouldn't understand. Here's the technique using Ronastar. We have software that helps really big companies save money. We're in industries like automotive, technology, manufacturing, government. Our clients are United Airlines, NASA, Chicago Public Schools. In the really big companies, we deal with the CFO, the chief financial officer. And we'd love to meet the CFO for the state of California, the city of Los Angeles, and any of the big studios. Now that's... 18 to 24 seconds, I just described what we do is save money and what we need are CFOs. If I were looking for funding, I would do it the same way. So here's what I did. When I was sitting in the back earlier, I am now in my own band. And my band is called Not This But That. So I started up my own band because you guys may be sitting out there going, well, how does this work for entertainment? I don't get it. So my band is Not This But That. What do we do? We created a brand new sound of what I call reggae jazz. We have an amazing horn section and we can move people to the dance floor or we can move them to tears. That's what we do. I'm trying to make it sound cool. I don't know. But hey, I'm trying to expand my business. So I'm looking for a relationship with brands and sponsors and management groups who would like what I do. Directly, I'd love to meet companies like Red Bull and Unilever and others who are kind of in that younger space for, for my sound. Management, I'd love to be represented by the collective or Red Light or Prospect Park. If you know anybody there, that's really what I'm trying to do to expand my business. And the guys I'd love to meet are Andy Walsh, Mike Mathal, or Mark Mathal, Troy Carter, Aaron Ray, Bruce Floor, and others. Again, point. Who knows Andy Walsh? Anybody know who Andy Walsh is? He runs Red Bull. Red Bull Marketing. Mark Mathal, head of Unilever Global Marketing. Troy Carter for Lady Gaga. Aaron Ray, he'll be here after me at some point, runs the collective. Bruce Floor, Red Light Management, 150 bands. Yeah, Dave Matthews. Yeah, he's Dave Matthews' manager. So, yeah. My point is... Get one out of five. That's good. We were trying to get Bruce to come speak. He's a great guy. Yeah. So my point is, if I'm in a band, I'm not sitting around being reactive, hoping to get discovered. I'm saying, here's what I want, here's what I need, here's who I'm trying to get to, who can help me? And I'm going to do the research to find the people. 
within the brands, within the sponsors, within the companies. I can't say, hey, I want Coca-Cola if I don't know who in Coca-Cola is going to be the person I try and talk to. So, tornado technique is right there in the middle. Um, here's how you use it on others. A lot of times when you talk to people, again, if you're doing networking, the tornado technique for use on others is when you meet somebody, you can reverse the conversation. When people are talking to me all the time, I'm like, okay, hang on, slow down. Like, what do you do? What, what do clients love about what you do? What's the value? Okay. What industries are you in? Who are your clients? Who are you trying to get to? Give me your wish list. I'm reversing the conversation when I talk to somebody in three to five you know, minutes, I can ask them questions to figure out what they need to try and add value. And the technique for that, any of you guys that are taping this, I, I'll send you the, the whole presentation if you want it or send you all this with everything because I'm going through pretty quick. But the technique that I actually do next is called deflect, defer, and disclose. Now this one takes a, a little bit of practice, not much, but it's pretty simple. You guys been networking, been to events, right? Reading name tags, right? And somebody walks up and, all right, like, what's your name? Joe. Joe. So Joe and I meet, Joe and I both have our little name tags on, and Joe's like, oh, Stephen, you've got big bamboo, what do you do? And if I'm like, well, what do you do? That's called combat, right? The mind flares up, you're like, I just asked you a question, buddy, what an ass, just answer it. <laughs> So the mind, you have to answer a question without telling him anything. And then redirect a question back to be interested in him and then get control of the conversation. <laughs> so I would say, Joe, actually Big Bamboo is kind of cool. It's a little incubator. We create technology companies. But anyway, man, I look, you're, you're with, what's the name of your company? Or your band or group or what do you do? Collective. What? The collective. Oh, shit, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Joe, you're with the collective. How, what do you guys do, man? Is it a management? I'd love to learn more about it. All of a sudden, I've directed the question back, and now in that process, I can deflect and defer questions to Joe. And I can say, oh, you're at the collective, man. How long have you been there? Do you know Aaron? Do you know Mike? Who do you work with? Are you in the digital department? Oh, that's cool. What are you looking for? Like, what are the three things? I'm going to find out everything I can about Joe before I disclose what I do to Joe. And here's why. Any of you guys that are artists, it's, it's really tough, I think, because... As an artist, you can be a writer, a producer, a director, you do songs, you, you can be anything to everybody. But you want to be something specific to somebody. Your conversation with Joe, if you know he's a manager at the collective, is a different conversation than the person who runs marketing at Coke. It's a different conversation than the person who books the bands at House of Blues. See, you don't know enough about that person to tell them what you do. So it's your responsibility to find out, but you have to do it in a way that's cool. It's like, oh, hey, I kind of do this over here. Don't look at the hand, but boom, what do you do? And when you deflect, defer, and disclose, you're going to disclose back. So if you use the tornado technique in reverse, what's the value of what you do? What's your industry? Who are you trying to get to? You know, if, if Joe and I sat and talked, I could probably figure out the three or four things that are most important to Joe, what he's trying to accomplish at the collective, what he does, where he's trying to go. And I might know somebody that can help them. And this becomes the key for number five. The fifth one's called referral currency. This is what I call psychological warfare. If I'm talking to Joe, I'm going to use a reverse tornado again. What do you do? I'm going to start making mental notes. Oh, that's what you do in digital, Joe. That's cool. Hey, who are you trying to get to? Oh, you're, you're trying to get to these guys. Oh, you're already working. Oh, you don't want Prospect Park. Oh, you want these guys. Oh, I've got it. I'll make a note, two, three, four, five people. If it gets past five, I start forgetting. I start writing down names. But what I don't do when Joe and I are talking, this is the mistake. Any of you guys that have ever done this, if Joe and I are talking, again, it's okay I'll pick on you, Joe? Joe and I are talking, and he brings something up about, you know, a, a guy, Lincoln Park. I'm like, oh, my God, I know Mike at Lincoln Park. Do you know Mike? All of a sudden, I've taken that creative conversation, and I've jumped in because I want to throw in a name that says, oh, look, I know this person. You guys ever done that with a conversation? People are like, oh, well, I know this person. Do you know him? And you're like, well, yeah, but I'm, we're still. You've got to control that conversation. So make a note, two or three or four or five names, if you know them. So when I'm done with somebody like Joe, and I've asked him enough questions, I've figured out what's important to him, I know how to add value, I would say, hey, Joe, I'll tell you what, as soon as we're done here, I've got three or four guys I'd like to introduce you to. So here's, here's XYZ guy at this company. I think he'd help you. Uh, here's another guy. Here's what he is. Here's what he does. I think 
you know, he could help. I'll try and come up with two or three or four names. Might not be able to. Sometimes people are in industries I know nothing about, but occasionally I can come up with some pretty good names. So I'll do that to Joe and say, here's two or three names. Remind me when we're done to get you introduced to them. Now let me tell you what I do. And I've just built a psychological referral burden on poor Joe. Where Joe's like, oh, this guy's going to give me three or four names, man. Your psychology opens up, your reticular activator's open, you're going to pay attention, and you're going to get the introduction to the two or three or four people that are Joe's best guys. That's how when people say, oh, well, why would somebody introduce you to somebody? Because I established credibility, I figured out what was important to him, I tried to add value, and then when I explain what I do, I'm going to be extremely relevant in my conversation with Joe because I know what Joe's want and I can reframe what I do to what's important to him. If I'm talking to a sponsor, I reframe what I'm doing to help that sponsor. If I'm in a VC, I, re I can reframe everything. Does it mean I'm not being authentic? I'm being really authentic, but I'm being much more specific and isolated and targeted. But this referral burden, if used properly, allows you to get two or three or four names of people that you might not otherwise get access to. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, the rest of this gets super easy. Learn how to call a referral. If you get referrals from people, you'll end up with names of direct people. You'll end up, if you want Irvin Azoff, if you want you know, Steinbrenner, if you want Steinberg, if you want Lucas, you'll get access to these people. There's a specific way to call. And the reason I teach how to make a phone call, this to me is fascinating. Most people don't call anymore, they email. So you're in offices when people have two and three and four hundred or a thousand email, their phone never rings. I can pick up the phone and call people and they actually answer the phone. I'm like, oh, hey, hell. Because nobody calls anymore. So if you, if you actually call, there's a certain way to call. Here's how it works. You don't say, I'm gonna, we're going to switch sides of the room. What's your name? Hal. Hal or Hal? Hal. Hal with an H. So if I called Hal, this may be a typical conversation some of you guys have had. Hey, Hal, this is Steven Mead. I've got this cool new company in, in L.A. and we're launching. It's in the mobile space. And I'd love to talk to you because John thought you'd be good to talk to. And so, you know, here's what we did. You guys ever had that? And you're going, who is this person? Why did I call? Caller ID, his name wasn't in my freaking phone. I knew I shouldn't have answered this. Yeah. And you're like, uh, wait, and you're trying to get a word in. That's what happens. Here's how you call. There's three steps. Here's why I called. Here's who referred me. Did I catch it at a good time? So if I called Hal and said, hey, Hal, my name's Stephen Mead. I got your name and number from Scott Page over at the Indy Summit. Did I catch you at a good time? It's, here's my name. Here's who referred me. Did I catch you at a good time? What that gives Hal a chance to do is, number one, realize he doesn't know me, but I got referred by Scott, and did I catch you at a good time? Allows him to say, yeah, you did go ahead. I've got a minute. Or no, actually, you didn't. Great. Is there another time I can call? See, when you're calling really important people, just being respectful enough to say, did I catch you at a good time, is a differentiator from other people who are so excited they answered the phone that they just dive right in. But if you're getting referred in, the credibility of the person who refers you is going to get you the time. All right, so when you call, it's just really simple, you know, and if he says yes, right, hello, here's my name. I was given it by, did I catch it at a good time? No pause. Do not pause. If you just say, hey, my name's Stephen Mead, how's like, great, who are you? Hey, I was given your name by Scott Page. He's like, yes, yeah, so what, why are you calling? It's like, boom, boom. Name, Scott Page, did I catch it at a good time? If he says yes, great, here's specifically why I'm calling, and now I can use a tornado technique or something that says, here's the emotional value, here's what I'm doing, here's why Scott thought you would be interested. It's really short and quick and timely, and it moves you through conversations at a really super fast level. Uh, learn how to make an introduction. This one's always fun if you're out and about, especially if you're doing a lot of events and you want people to help you at the events. Learn how to make introductions. If I met Joe at the collective and I met Hal and I knew those two should meet, even though I don't know them, I'd say, hey, Hal, come here for a second. Should meet Joe. Hey, Joe, I just met Hal a minute ago. Here's what Hal does. Super cool. Sounds like he can help you with what you're doing. Here's Joe in the collective. You guys should talk. I don't say, Joe, meet Hal. You guys should talk. It's like, talk about what? Yeah. You know? Yeah, you put them on this. No, you set the table for the point of introduction of why you think it's important. Now, what you've just done in, in an event again or in a situation is you've added value where, again, this isn't about retribution, but Joe and Hal are both going to remember what you do 
go, man, he just brought somebody over. This is totally cool. I wonder if I can help that guy. Can I help that girl? Right? It's super easy to do. It doesn't take you time, but you end up with people in an event working for you because you've helped them and made two quick introductions. It's just about building up that currency. And there's a big point I put in here, especially in Hollywood. There's a difference, in my opinion, between refer and recommend. I don't know if you noticed, when I set the introduction up, I'm like, hey, Joe, I just met Hal. I just met Joe. You guys should talk. I'm not recommending. I didn't say I've known Hal for 10 years. He's amazing. I think Hal may screw up whatever he does with Joe. I, I'm not in the middle of that. Hey, I just met you two. You're on your own. Right? So recommend and refer is different. I, I don't have any issue making introductions, but I preface the introduction to protect myself. It allows me to make a lot of introductions, but if I've done the right aspect of asking good questions, I know how to make really good introductions because I know what the people are looking for. I know what they want. Learn how to make an introduction. Take meetings early and often. This one, again, for entertainment is good. We use it in, in our business all the time. If you wanted, if you had a chance, like who, who's looking for management or an agent or a television? Who do you want to meet? Do you know? Well, I, I mean, after this, we're trying to look at CAA. We've worked with them before, but we're trying to redo it. So we're trying to figure out who's best there. We haven't figured out yet. Okay. Well, once you figure it out, my next question would be, are you ready? Do you think you're ready? We're, we're finishing up our album, so we have, we're waiting on that to pitch it. So. Okay. So you just proved my point, is you don't think you're ready. Right. Not in a bad way. A lot of people in entertainment, you know, especially managers, give really bad advice. Oh, you need to finish your reel. You need to add more credits. You need more of this or less of that. Hey, if you, got, if you had the opportunity to be introduced to the number one guy at CAA that you want to meet, you take that meeting. But you take that meeting not under the premise of going in and saying, look how great I am. Look at this. You, you're going in humbly saying, hey, here's what we're building. I, I appreciate the chance to meet you. I'd love to show you what we're doing, and maybe one day we could be represented by you. You know, if I learned enough about what you were looking for at CAA in your particular area, maybe one day we can hit those targets. I'd love to, to take you to coffee and learn what that's about. I take meetings early and often, but I go in under the premise. Like a lot of the times we start a company, we go in saying, why won't this work? You know, I'll get introduced to huge, amazing people. We don't go in saying, look at our great technology. I just did this with Condé Nast the other day. My buddy runs digital. He was in town, we're doing this little magazine out, and I sat down with Robert and I said, Robert, I'm going to show you something, and I want to know every reason what I'm doing isn't going to work. If you've seen competition like this, if you think this is stupid, if you think the brands won't do it, I need to know every reason somebody like you would tell me no. And I take that meeting early because what I end up doing is showing them what we're, we're all about in a premise that allows them to be negative and critical. But ends up happening is he's like, man, this is great. This is cool. I can help you. Here's the areas to go. So if I were in entertainment, I would take meetings with managers and agents. But I would take it not under the premise of me thinking I'm ready, but going in saying, here's what I'm doing. What can I do to one day get to this point? And it just it opens you up to have better conversations where people don't have to tell you no. Because I think that's what happens a lot of times is people are in pitching themselves and, and you know, either they're worried about telling no or the agents are saying, we're going to have to tell you no. Just find out what people need. Again, it's the what's in it for you. What are they looking for? Number nine, ask, ask great questions. You know, what would it take to make this work? What are the top things you're, you're working on? What are you most motivated by at the collective? Hey, in your digital strategy, what are the two or three things that you're really trying to accomplish this year? Every, everything with me is top two or three. Not, hey, what are you working on? Hey, Joe, what's over at the collective? Well... The list is long. What are the top two or three things that are most important to you? What are, what are the things you're most passionate about? It's like, what are the top one or two or two or three? That's the way the mind isolates and thinks about ideas. And if you learn how to ask great questions, this leads to step 10, and then we're, we're done and wrapping up here, is build a good advisory board. No matter what your business is, if you can get a good advisory board using, what's your name? Finian. Finian? Finian. Finian. Opinion, yeah. So let's let's say you had the opportunity to meet with the guy at CAA, knowing that your album's not done and you guys aren't ready, but he liked you enough to possibly join the advisory board, so when you're ready, you've got him on your board, and you've got guys at Collective, and you've got guys at Coke. See, the advisory board allows you to have additional credibility. It allows you to gain value. But what ends up happening with the advisory board 
is these guys are usually not asked. I don't think I have it on here. Nope. Okay. What one question do you think most people aren't asked in a position of power? You finally get your meeting. You've got your meeting with your rock star number one guy. And, you know, Irving Azoff. I don't know. I'm making up. People. What do you think is the question that's not asked of guys in power? What should we do? What can I help you with? What can I help you with? So not everybody's going to ask. They're like, oh, it's, it's Irving. What could I possibly ask? The point is most people don't even ask what can I do to help or what can I do for you. But if you do ask, that's the wrong way to ask. You know, because they'll pat you on the head and hit you on the butt. No, kid, <laughs> you know, no, yeah, no, it's no. It's what are the top two or three things you're most passionate about right now that if I run across somebody and can help you, I'd love to do it. What are the one or two things that are your biggest problems you're trying to solve? Just in case I don't even think I know anybody, but if I did, I'd love to be able to send somebody your way to help you. If you knew what the top people on your list wanted to get solved, is that an open door? So you've got an open door for some of the top people in the world to help solve their problem. And trust me, when you know what they want, somebody will come up, you're like, oh, hey, yeah. I was just with Irving the other day, and I can't believe I met you. You're building currency. You're building referral. But you have to do it in a way to ask, what are the top two or three things you want? And so your advisors provide a good path, but they also provide credibility. But there's ways you can help them just by asking. All right? And I'll give you one quick little example so far off the radar. I like giving off the radar ones, and, and then we're done. Uh, one of our members um, on our software company was the chief of staff of NASA four presidential administrations. Every secret between NASA and the president went through this guy. So the stuff on Mars, some crazy stuff out there, if you believe it, I, I don't know, but interesting conversations. But I was sitting with him in Washington and the guy's got access to everybody through government. And I used this technique on him, his, his name is, it was Courtney. I'm like, Courtney, hey, let's put all the, the government stuff aside. Your, your help's been amazing. Outside of work, like, what are you most passionate about? Give me the top, you know, one or two projects you're passionate about. And he stopped and he looked at me and he goes, well, let me tell you a story. And I, I can barely get through this story, but he told a story of, and I'm not religious, so if I mess up the terminology, I'm sorry, of this tiny Torah, which the, the Jewish priests or rabbis took into the concentration camps and used during the Holocaust. And they would pray with this little Torah and they knew that they were probably going to die, but they knew if they got caught with it, they'd be killed instantly. When the Holocaust was over, they snuck this little thing out. And it was a very famous religious document. And it was given to the first Israeli astronaut ever flying in the space shuttle to be as close to God as possible. And that was the challenger that blew up with the first Israeli astronaut. So he was doing a documentary on the tiny Torah. And he's like, see me, he goes, I'm stuck in Washington, I don't know, and I'm like... Wow, that's weird. I know the guys that did the stuff with Mel Gibbs. I, I knew people, not that I'm in that industry. But because I asked, it's like, wow, here's something completely off the reservation. And four years later, his documentary was done, the film is done. So just the point in asking, I had an open door for years to send them people I ran into. So build a good advisory board is cool. The current advisors don't really matter. I mean, we can get to anybody. You guys with these techniques can get to anybody anywhere. Experience is the greatest teacher. It's also the slowest. So read books, do seminars, that's why you guys are here. Appreciate that. Success, why not it be me? It's up to any of you guys. And I'm going to leave you guys with this. This is the last thing. What are your beliefs? What are your goals? What do you want to do? Right? Any of you guys want to be really famous? Successful? Rich? Philanthropy? It doesn't matter. Whatever you want to do. Right? I've got really big goals. And we've kind of been up on some and down. And it's, it's fun. It's a journey. But I used to have people go, oh, Stephen, well, well, what if you don't make it? What if, you know, what if you don't hit your target for your financial goals? And what if you don't do all these things? And I'd look at them and say, you know what, you're right. We may not hit our goals. If I do, I change my family tree forever. I'll retire my parents early. I know what I'm <coughs> doing for my niece and nephew. I know the cars I'm going to send to my brother. I know the plane I'm buying for my soccer guys to fly around. I know the, the school I'm going to build. and the life. I've already thought what happens if I make it. But if I don't and I fail, I can always go get a job and I'll be just like you. <laughs> See, it takes guts to say that, but to me, these people saying, oh, what if you don't make it, had jobs that I didn't want. 
So if you want to be special, if you want to be different, be willing to step out there and say, I can always go get a job, but that's not what you want. So that's me. Isolation is a good thing. And you guys that want this presentation, just let me know and I'll email it to you. Thanks. Yeah. That was pretty valuable, huh? Yeah. Isn't that awesome? I mean, it just flipped me out, I tell you. So anyway, I want you to, I want you to know, first of all, Stephen, thank you very much for being flexible today and hanging out because we had a little mishaps.